Hello, Tom. You've said many times that your experiments, if the results are as you predict they will be, will help bring us into a kinder, gentler, more cooperative world. Could you please tell us in a little more detail how that would happen? Sure. That is a rather large logical stretch, going from physics experiments and quantum mechanics to a kinder, gentler world to live in. And it's not obvious all the steps one would take to go from one to the other. But indeed, they are related. The physics experiments are experiments to provide very solid evidence for virtual reality indeed being the state of our universe, that this universe is a virtual reality. That's a hypothesis now. It's called the simulation hypothesis. But there's not been a lot of strong experimental evidence for it. There's been dozens of efforts to produce some experimental evidence, but mostly they kind of come out, well, yes, it looks like it could be a virtual reality, but they don't really make a strong enough statement to capture the majority of scientists. Uh, after all, this is a pretty strange pill to swallow that we live in a virtual reality, that our bodies are just avatars and that we are consciousness and and so on. That's a rather big step and it, it uh, requires science to give up on a belief it has that this is a material reality based on matter, force, space. We've believed that now for hundreds of years and to uh, have all that, you know, have that materialistic rug pulled right out from under our feet is a rather big thing. So scientists need not only a little bit of proof or showing that, that virtual reality does better physics, they need something that will help them get over that barrier of 300 years of, of scientific belief in a materialistic reality. And these experiments will do that. These experiments uh, have very unique results. You might say that these experiments perform miracles. They do things that have no explanation of why that would work that way. You know, the double slit is that way. The double slit experiment had a result, which is you fire single particles at the slits and you end up with a diffraction pattern. Well, that should be impossible. So when you do the impossible, we'll just call that a, you know, it's a miracle because that's what doing the impossible means. So that was a, a, a miracle of itself, but a kind of a minor miracle. Okay, we get a diffraction pattern and physicists dealt with that by saying that, okay, well, sometimes it's a particle and sometimes it's a wave. It can be either one depending on how you look at it. Well, you don't have to be a scientist to know that that's a pretty wishy-washy way of describing reality. Here's our description of reality. Sometimes it's like this and then other times it's like that. And that's not really very satisfying, but they had no other choice because that was the, the miracle that happened. You send particles one at a time through slits and they distribute themselves in a wave pattern, not a particle pattern. Okay, so now my experiments are going to do some things that are even more dramatic as far as performing miracles. That is things that should be impossible. And when science does something that's impossible, that seems impossible, what science is telling you, what that impossible thing is telling you is that your understanding of how reality works isn't right. It isn't complete. Because if you had a good, complete understanding of the nature of reality, it wouldn't seem impossible. You'd understand why it is that way and why it has to be that way. So when science tells us that there's something seems to be going on that's impossible, like tunneling, like the placebo effect, like uh, the Zeno effect, all the quantum mechanics effects pretty much that are unusual, they tell us that we don't really understand the nature of reality. Otherwise, it wouldn't seem impossible. It's impossible because we are ignorant of why it's really working the way it is, you see? 
So when these experiments of mine, if they work the way I want them to, or the way I think they will, they will do several things more dramatic than displaying particles as, you know, in wave patterns. They will do some dramatic things that will pile up some very strong evidence on the side of this being a virtual reality. Well, that's step one. So we need to get these experiments done because scientists believe experiments. They may do them and redo them and do them again and you know, check them four or five times, but when they're done with all of that and the experiment holds and it's sound, then it becomes a fact, a fact they have to deal with. And a few more miracles on their, you know, on their plate that they have to explain uh, will help them see that virtual reality provides the only solution. Only in a virtual reality could these things happen. The second step is scientists will soon, after a bit, and probably they will be helped by the philosophers in this case, they will come to realize that the only rational explanation for a virtual reality producing this reality it does is that the computer that's computing the reality is consciousness. Now we discussed this in the last time that we had a chat, we talked about different ways to see in a VR. And you can see it as consciousness is the computer, and that makes sense. But you can see it as aliens are the computer, or future humans are the computer, and that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold up. It's not logical. The only logical uh, conclusion you can come to is that consciousness is the computer. Well, when you come to that conclusion, you then have to also uh, accept that this virtual reality is a subset, is computed by something else that's bigger, something that is non-physical to us, because a virtual reality can't be computed from inside the virtual reality. It has to be computed outside the virtual reality. And because virtual realities work with a player communicating with a computer. If the player and the computer are communicating, they have to be in the same reality frame. So the source of our reality has to be consciousness, you see, because the computer has to be within this consciousness system. That's the only way, that's the only logical way that falls out. There isn't any other way that is logical. And eventually science gets around to being logical, even if they deny and, and, and uh, you know, they can stick their heads in the sand for a while. But logic does win out in the, in the end. So the experiments cause us to see that virtual reality is a very good assumption, which gets us to the point that consciousness is the computer, which gets us to the point that we, our bodies, our avatars, and the player, our consciousness, is the one making the choices. And that the computer and the player, our consciousness, are non-physical to our virtual reality. Well, then logically from that, we see that we're a subset of something bigger, more powerful, and more fundamental than we are. And that superset is non-physical to us. Well, now that's a real big idea. You see, science now starting to sound like theology. You see, theology has been telling us that there is this uh, non-physical source somewhere and we are a subset of that. And science has always said nonsense, where's the proof? Well, you see, we're getting to the point where our physics is coming to the same conclusion, but that there is this system of consciousness of which we are a part of which the computer is a part. We as conscious are a part, and the virtual reality then has to be computed for some reason. A virtual reality is not just a trivial thing. It takes a lot of planning. Uh, the virtual reality had to start with a rule set that defined what interactions could take place. It had to then have an outer time loop. And then the run button was hit, and it starts to evolve, 
And what it evolved into is this universe with planet Earth, you know, our solar system with the sun, and we inhabiting it. That's what evolved. Well, that's not just a trivial thing that happened just because it happened and for no particular purpose. There is a purpose. Consciousness then, logically, must be an information system. Consciousness is about information. That's what makes you conscious, is because you are aware of things. Now, in this, this virtual reality, you have five senses. You see, you hear, you feel, you touch, you taste. And that's how you know your environment. That's how you understand things. It's through that data, through that information. Consciousness is about data. It's about information. And it's about making choices. Because within that information, you get to make choices about how you're going to interact with it. Now, if you're an information system, you grow, you become, you evolve by creating more information, more valuable information. If you de-evolve, you end up with less information, less valuable information. So you see, information is a ordering of bits. It's an ordering of bits. If you have all random bits, you have no information. You order those bits, now you can create information. So we can measure the, the quality, or if you'd like, the status in the evolution of consciousness in terms of entropy, in terms of order. If there's more order, that's lower entropy. Less order, that's higher entropy. So information systems evolve by lowering their entropy. Now in a social system, and consciousness is a social system, we have lots of individuated units of consciousness, which would be you and I, and we interact with each other. Consciousness is a social system. There's not just one monolithic consciousness, but there are lots of individuated units of consciousness that all belong to the same source to the same consciousness system. So all of these consciousness form a social system and they have a mission. And their mission is to evolve rather than de-evolve because that's like survive rather than live. So that's the fundamental mission is to reduce your entropy, for consciousness to reduce its entropy. In a social system, the way you reduce entropy is through the individuated units of consciousness caring, cooperating, working together. You can produce so much more that way than if the consciousnesses are only for themselves, um, no trust, no caring, all about me. Uh, that doesn't build a stable system. Yes, you can build with that premise, but it's not stable. There's always somebody else that wants your job, wants your stuff, you know, wants your car and your house. There's always somebody else that wants your land, and they can get it if they have enough force. That's the nature of a, of a uh, system based on fear as opposed to a system based on love. Okay, so I break it out into those two generalized groups. So for consciousness to evolve, to grow, to increase their quality, increase their information and the significance of the information, they need to learn to be cooperative, caring. It needs to be more about other. And everybody has to win. The other way, there are winners and losers. Most of the people end up being losers and a few of the people end up being winners. That's just the nature of that system. Eventually, uh, a few people are in charge and a few people have most all the resources. The other system, everyone's existence, everyone's personal freedom, everyone's ability to do as they choose is optimized. There is maximum amount of personal freedom in the other system. And because of that, it produces more. It optimizes what it can do with the resources that are available. So, now let's kind of back up. So we have experiments that make virtual reality more plausible. 
we have then logic that says consciousness is the computer. We have a virtual reality created by consciousness for a purpose, and the only real purpose that consciousness has is to evolve, is to stay alive, not to de-evolve into nothingness and no information and disappear. So why would consciousness create a virtual reality in order to help individuated units of consciousness lower their entropy, raise the quality of their consciousness? In other words, the virtual reality is a entropy reduction simulator. It's a way that individuated units of consciousness can make choices, can interact, can express themselves, and in doing so, get feedback. And if that feedback is something that is joyful and good and rewarding and maximizes their own potential, then they are raising their level of evolution. They are evolving the quality of their consciousness. If that feedback is that they're miserable, unhappy, uh, struggling, can't seem to get it together, that would say they're doing the wrong thing. You see, that's saying that's fear-based. And when it's fear and ego and belief-based, it ends up being a struggle, uncomfortable, miserable, there's a lot of pain, there's very little happiness, at least not for very long. There's little islands of it, but not very long. And it doesn't take much of, a, of an awareness to look around us and see where we are right now as a human species on this planet. We obviously are in that fear-based camp. We as a people are up to our eyebrows in fear. We fear all sorts of things. We fear uncertainty. We fear death. We fear that we're not going to get our fair share. We fear we're going to be taken uh, advantage of. We fear that people won't like us. We fear that we're not lovable. We fear that we're inadequate. We fear that things won't work out the way we want. We fear that our children will become drug addicts. We fear that our, we'll get laid off at work. We fear, fear, fear. You see, we fear about where the next meal's coming from and if it rains, can, do we have shelter? We are f afraid of all sorts of things. There's lots of fear in the land, and indeed, just as I, I said, in that kind of an environment, it ends up with a few people owning almost all the resources and having almost all the control, and everybody else uh, is uh, struggling and can't seem to ever get ahead. That's just the nature of a fear-based society. Okay? And fear-based societies are not stable. They're constantly in turmoil. People who were in charge are constantly being torn down and new people are in charge. But those new people don't do anything really much different than the old people do. It just sounds better for a while, but it never seems to make a huge difference in the long run. So there's constant turmoil in a fear-based society. So you see the connection now. We start with experiments. Experiments eventually get us to consciousness as the computer. It's the only logical answer to who's created this virtual reality. Consciousness system has, and we're a part of that system. And why? Because it's a place where we can interact, where we can make choices, and those choices have significant results. There's consequences to our choices. And by those consequences, if we are optimizing our interactions with other people, then we are interacting with love and caring and cooperation. And that's growing, that's evolving. If those choices lead us to misery and unhappiness and it's all about me and my ego and what I want and this is what I believe and you need to do what I want, oh, I'll try to manipulate you to do what I want, I'll try to control you if I can to do what I want, then that is a dysfunctional society that's based on fear. So once we understand, once the scientists, the scientists now tell us that we are avatars in a virtual reality that is created by a consciousness system that is non-physical to us, that will change the whole attitude of millions, billions of people because now we're networked. Now we have the internet. These ideas don't take 500 years to spread to the next continent. 
These ideas will spread in a matter of a decade. It's a whole different ball game that we are here to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And this is all just a logical stream. Now, no, everybody won't get that like on the second day after the experiment is done. We'll do the experiments and that'll take a while, another, you know, five, ten years before people really get it and stop making excuses and let go of the denial and all that will take some time. It's not going to be quick. The truth isn't fragile. If, you, if you're patient enough, the truth will eventually float to the surface. So eventually, we'll see ourselves as in a virtual reality. It's a trainer, just like a flight trainer is for pilots. It's a trainer for us pieces of consciousness to interact with each other within a context where there's definite consequences. You see, if we just interact with each other as consciousness, all we do is move data back and forth. We just communicate with each other. There's not a lot of consequences to that. There's not a lot of moral choice and decision and feedback to that. So, to help our evolution along, we create a virtual reality. That virtual reality has a lot of rules, and as we interact within those rules, there's lots of moral choice, there's lots of feedback, there's lots of consequences for our choices, and that's how we learn. So we need that virtual reality to give us the experience by which we can learn, you see? So that's what the experiments have to do with living in a nicer, kinder, gentler environment. It's that the logic, after we get to the point of accepting virtual reality, the logic starts to flow one after another after another. There are no other logical solutions other than the string that I've just told you. I've been over it lots of ways from lots of directions. And I'm a scientist. I don't do this because I think it feels good and sounds good because love is a happier word than fear. It's because there is no other way. So these experiments will show us more about who we really are, what being real has to do with turning fear into love. You've just described that, realizing who we are. No man is an island, so we're not little islands of fear. Um, well, we are mostly, but we're we not what we're, be. what we shouldn't <laughs> be, right. We are mostly little islands of fear running around, each trying to look out for number one, each trying to make sure that we get everything we want for ourselves, for our loved ones, and that we're in control and bad things aren't going to happen to us. That's what we do. We are these little islands of fear running around, um, all trying to uh, get a bigger piece of the pie for ourselves. But that is not optimal and that is not stable. That is not sustainable. That just keeps crashing. It builds up and builds up till it gets to a peak and then it crashes and then it builds up and builds up and then it crashes. It's not a stable long-term way of existing, you see? So this is just, these experiments are going to hopefully get that, you know, think of this large round rock up on the top of a very high hill. And what those experiments are going to do is they're going to get that rock rocking a little bit and move it to the brink of the hill and push it over. And after that, it's all logic rolling downhill. From that point, we'll get the consciousness as the computer. We'll get the virtual reality as a trainer for us to make moral and ethical choices by which we evolve our quality. As we make immoral and unethical choices, we de-evolve as consciousness and our quality. As we care about others, as we have compassion, as we cooperate, we increase our quality, we evolve. As we're self-centered and we only care about ourselves, we de-evolve, you see? So it puts us in this trainer that helps us evolve. And like all trainers, we get better with time. And yes, people look around and say, well, it doesn't look like we've done very well. Look at all the, you know, the hate and misery and uh, negativity in the world. But we have done better. Contrast that with the hate and negativity that was in the world even 500 years ago. We've done a lot better and we will continue. So eventually, we're going to end up a much happier, a much more peaceful, a much more productive 
with a lot more personal freedom to do what we want, when we want, how we want, to grow to the greatest extent our potential allows. We will have that kind of freedom, that kind of life to live here. And it all starts, it all starts with pushing that rock off the edge of that hill. And these experiments are the thing that's gonna, they're the pry bars that are gonna pry that rock loose and get it started rolling. Now, that rock eventually is gonna, is gonna roll down anyway but it may take us another two or three centuries to get there. Again, the truth always floats to the top eventually. So we will get there anyway, but kinder and gentler to me, I'd rather have that sooner than later. I don't think it can come any too soon and letting it go for, you know, a couple of more centuries of greed and avarice and, you know, it's all about me and self-centered, uh, um, attitudes toward the, the way you get along in the world is to give as little as you have to and get as much as you can for it. You know, that's, that's the way to get along. That kind of thinking needs to go away. It's not stable, it's not sustainable, and it doesn't work very well actually for anybody. Because even those few in that fear-based reality who seem to be on top of it all. They are the few that have most all the resources and all the power. They're not happy. They're not having a good life. It may look that way from outside, but you don't find happiness. You don't find satisfaction. You don't find pleasure even in power and in resources. That's not where it comes from. You see, we imagine that because we mostly materialists and we think if we had all the material stuff of our dreams, we'd be really happy, but you wouldn't be. You'd very quickly get tired of playing with your toys and you'd look for meaning, for value, for content. So you think, well, only a few make it to the top and they're winners, they're happy. They're not winners or happy. They just have all the marbles and they have a lot of power and they have a lot of resources but they're just as miserable for the most part as everybody else because they are failing what it is we're here to do, which is to become love, to grow up, to evolve ourselves, evolve the quality of our consciousness. That's why we're here. So no, nobody's really happy. There are no winners in that fear-based society. Only from a materialistic view do you see winners and losers. From a bigger picture view of quality of consciousness, all you see is losers on that fear side. On the other side, on the love side, everybody's a winner. There are no losers. Everybody is growing. Everybody is learning to become more moral, more ethical, more caring, you see? So that's where we're going. And that's what experiments have to do with a kinder, gentler, nicer place to live. And if these experiments here in 2018 or 2019 get done and that ball starts to wobble up there on the edge of that cliff, we're gonna get this, this kinder, gentler world a whole lot sooner rather than later. Now we've been working on this goal since humans you know, climbed out of the trees and started walking around on two feet. But only now do we have the facility, the technology to pull it off. You see, there's always been people all through history. Even if you go back, you know, 5,000 years, there were people who understood this, who had the big picture. These ideas aren't brand new. You know, you had the Buddha saying that this is a, a simulation. He didn't say simulation. He said it is an illusion. That this reality is just an illusion. But you've had people who understood it. But these people have never been in the mainstream. They've always been in a little side eddy out of the mainstream. And though their ideas would spread, it really is not enough because it's a belief. There's no science behind it. There's no logic behind it. So it really couldn't get a hold and grow. But now, you see, with these experiments in quantum mechanics, there is science behind it. There is logic behind it. This is not belief-based. This is science-based. This is experiment-based. That's different. That's a real big difference. And 
we have an internet that can spread these ideas and share them and debate them and talk about them and interact about them that we didn't have before. So instead of it being a little, you know, eddy off on the side of the mainstream, a little puddle of enlightenment, if you say, this time it's got all the things that it needs to become mainstream, which means to affect everyone. And as we the people understand this and we grow up, we grow ourselves, all of those that we now fault for being the problem, you know, the politicians, the, you know, the corporations, you know, the whatever, you know, the governments, the people who just don't understand and are taking advantage of all the rest of us, all of that will change on its own. As we the people change, our institutions and our governments and our corporations and our legal system and our social norms will all change as well. So indeed, we have a chance to change the world here in a very big, very fundamental, very long-lasting way just by changing the way we see ourselves and the way we see ourselves in the world and how we see ourselves interacting with each other. What's our point? What's our purpose here? Why are we here? See, all those questions get answered. And it starts with a couple of quantum mechanics experiments that pull off a couple of miracles that confuse the hell out of all the scientists who start looking for answers and reasons why and who find that the only answer and reason why that makes any sense is that this is a virtual reality and consciousness is the computer. And from there, it's logic, you know, all the way to this kinder, gentler world. So that's how they're connected. Thank you, Tom. Let's get this ball rolling on those physics experiments. Shall Let's we? get the ball rolling, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed.